thank you so much, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, and thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me. I mean, just the word, actually, for happiness. I'm like, I am so in. Um, this is great. And I love London so much, so I am so happy to be here. Um, and I'm so happy to get the chance to talk about the four tendencies with you tonight. And as Mark mentioned, we're going to have time for questions and answers at the end. So really, be thinking of your questions. That's always my favorite part. Um, because I love talking about the four tendencies because I really think as we're trying to figure out like how we can make ourselves happier, healthier, more productive, more creative, and also much more fun, how to help other people um, to uh, clean up their act sometimes, um, it's really helpful to understand how we're alike and how we're different. Um, but before I start, I'm going to throw out some questions to you. Raise your hand if anybody has ever accused you of being too rigid. My hand's up. OK. Raise your hand if anybody's ever told you that you ask too many questions. Oh, OK. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever thought to yourself, ah, oh, commitments to other people cannot be broken. But commitments to myself, eh, those I can break. OK. OK. And then finally, has anyone ever said, why is it that you will never do anything I tell you to do? <laughs> OK, a few hands. Um, so these set the stage for the four tendencies. So they say there are two kinds of people in the world, the kind of people who like to divide the world into two kinds of people and the kind of people who don't. And I'm the kind of people who does. Um, and I got my first insight into what turned into the four tendencies when I was having a very ordinary lunch with a friend. And she said something that, even though it was something that I'd heard many times from other people, just electrified me. I am, as my sister Elizabeth calls me, a, a little bit of a happiness bully, and I was quizzing her about her happiness habits, and she said, well, you know, the weird thing about me is I know I would be happier if I exercised. And when I was in high school, I was on the track team, and I never missed track practice, so why can't I go running now? And this just blew my mind. I thought, it's the same person, it's the same behavior. At one time, it was effortless, now she can't do it. What is going on? And I became determined to solve this puzzle. Because a lot of times we know perfectly well what would make us happier. But we're just not able to follow through with it. Why or why not? Um, and as I started looking for patterns, I started seeing more and more and more. And, but it wasn't until one day um, that I, I, saw, I got the word in my head that sort of made it all clear. I was looking down at my to-do list, and all of a sudden it hit me. It, the key idea was expectation. And as soon as I figured out expectations, all these patterns that were swirling around in my head started to make sense. Now, of course, we all face two kinds of expectations. Outer expectations, like a work deadline or a request from a friend, and uh, inner expectations, our own desire to keep a New Year's resolution, our own desire to get back into par practicing guitar. And I realized that how we respond to expectations determines whether we're an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. So what I'm going to do is explain these four very quickly. Um, if you want to take a quiz that will give you an answer, you can go to happiercast.com slash quiz, or just go to my web website, GretchenRubin.com. Like a million people have taken, literally a million people have taken this quiz, but most people don't. You don't even need to take the quiz, because I'm going to give you a brief description, and most people know exactly what they are, and also the people around them, just from a very brief description. And then I'm going to go through and ask you to raise your hands, because I think it'll be really interesting to know who's here tonight. And then I'm going to give you some ideas about how you can use it to make your life better, and also how to work and communicate more effectively with other people by taking their tendency into account. But before I start, let me give you a warning. I sometimes get a very strong feeling that people are trying to figure out what is the best tendency <laughs> and shoehorn themselves in. And I assure you, all of these tendencies have great strengths and great weaknesses. They all include people who have been very, very successful and also big, big losers. So be honest. <laughs> um, so here we go. Upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what others expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. Questioners question all expectation. They'll do it if they think it makes sense. So they make everything an inner expectation. If it meets their inner standard, they will do it. If it fails their standard, they will resist. They typically don't like things that are arbitrary, inefficient, irrational. Their first question is, why would I listen to you? 
Next, obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. So this is my friend on the track team. When she had a team and a coach waiting for her, she had no trouble showing up. But when she was just trying to go running on her own, she struggled. And then finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do. They can do anything they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. OK. And now, if you're thinking to yourself, I question the validity of this framework, you're probably a questioner. OK. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you now to raise your hand. Upholder, my hand's up. That's my tendency. Upholders readily meet outer and inner expectation. OK, Mark, Mark stands up. OK, next, questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do it if they think it makes sense. OK, next, obligers. Obligers readily meet outer, struggle to meet inner. All right, and then rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. OK, so what we see here, it was hard to tell exactly what the numbers are, but I think this is basically what I would expect to see generally, because there's a very, a very common pattern. The biggest tendency for both men and women, the one that has the most people in it, is obliger. That is the biggest tendency. You either are an obliger or you have many obligers in your life. That is the biggest tendency. After that, questioners. That's definitely what we saw here. We might have even had more questioners than obligers, so it's hard for me to tell. The smallest tendency, it's a conspicuous tendency, but it's a small tendency, is rebel. There are not very many rebels, and my tendency, the upholder tendency, only slightly larger. These are kind of the two uh, polar um, uh, personality types. And I remember when I was coming up with this, I walked into my husband and I was like, you know what? I'm part of this like, small, extreme personality type. And he was like, you think? Uh, he was not surprised. He's a questioner. Um, so what do we do with this information? Um, how do we put it to use? Because the fact is it can help us manage ourselves better, but it can also help us understand other people and work with them better too because we can understand how they see the world in a different way, how what works for us might not work for them and vice versa. So starting with upholders, um, one of my favorite things in writing the book was coming up with the mottos for the tendencies. And the, the, my favorite motto for upholders is, discipline is my freedom. And for upholders, upholders, there's a lot of advantages to being an upholder. Um, they're self-starters, they're self-reliant, they don't need a lot of supervision. Um, they, uh, they're very reliable. Um, they can really execute on anything that they seek to do. But like all the tendencies, the strengths are also weaknesses. And so one thing that you often see with upholders is they're not good when plans change suddenly, when they need to be flexible, when it's not clear what expectations are or it's ambiguous what is expected of them. Um, upholders can also experience tightening. This is when the rules get tighter. And sometimes this can be fine, and sometimes it can be not so great. I remember a friend of mine who's an upholder got one of those devices, you know, that counts your steps, and he had decided he was going to take 10,000 steps a day. And he said to me, like, last night it was midnight, my wife was asleep in bed, and I was in the bathroom jogging next to the toilet because I was going to get my steps in. You know, it's like, maybe that's good, maybe that's not so good. Like, you don't want to be a, the mindless bureaucrat filling in your own red tape, you know? So, it's, and you, and so if you're dealing with a, a, an upholder, you don't want to emphasize like, too much what they need to do because it can tighten. And then the final thing about, uh, about upholders is that they can sometimes seem cold and judgmental to others. And this can come because of their, they have this, this commitment to their own inner expectation that can look cold. So for instance, so my colleague and I, we, all, we both have our reports due tomorrow. And my colleague says to me, hey, will you pro proofread my report? And I would say, I'm sorry, my report's due tomorrow too. I don't have time to help you out. Now, to an upholder, that seems perfectly acceptable and appropriate, but to someone else, that could look quite cold. And they also can be judgmental because they often don't have insight into why others might struggle in circumstances where they're not struggling. Next, questioners. So, uh, the motto of the questioners is, if you convince me why, then I'll comply. So they always want to know why, and they have this drive for efficiency and explanation and justification. Um, they, they tend to love research. They're great for everybody because they keep us on track. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it this way? Why are we doing it by Friday? Why are we using the software? Why am I listening to you? Um, and that's good for everybody. It keeps us from wasting our time. But upsides are downsides. And questioners can drain and overwhelm others with their constant questioning. Um, I did an event one time where somebody raised her hand and she said, 
do you think it's okay to say that you can only ask three questions for conversation and, you know, with your spouse? And I was like, I think that is a cry for help. Um, <laughs> so, so it can become overwhelming because the questioners just need to have those robust justifications. Um, and questioners can also, not all questioners experience this, but some questioners have analysis paralysis. This is where their drive for perfect information makes it hard for them to make a decision or, um, or uh, move forward because, you know, in this world, a lot of times we have to do things without perfect information. You know, you want to buy a tent, you could spend the rest of your life researching tents because as soon as there's more information, um, you know, there would be more to come. And so in order to deal with analysis paralysis, um, there's, there's different things that you can use. For instance, you can use deadlines. We need an answer by Friday. It's not efficient to wait until after Friday, so by Friday I need your best answer. You can give limits. We're going to interview seven people for this position, but we're not going to interview 15. Or you could use trusted authorities, like, okay, I'm going to read consumer reports. Or I'm going to go to this tent store where these people really know about tents, and I'm going to, I'm going to really be guided by their judgment. Um, but this is important because it can, be, it can start to be um, really uh, uh, difficult to manage. I, I, have a friend, I have two friends who are married to each other, they're both questioners, and they wanted to get a new dishwasher and it took a year and a half. Um, <laughs> because every time, it was like their summer house, and every time they were going to get a dishwasher, it was like, why, why this one? Why not that one? And if we're doing a dishwasher, maybe we should do the countertops. And if we're doing the countertops, maybe we should do the deck. You know, I mean, and they couldn't come to the end of the questions until finally, guess what happened? They were gonna have guests for a month, and they were like, okay, we have to have a dishwasher before we have guests, so that imposed a deadline, and then they were able to move forward. Now, another thing that you see with questioners, and, and this is something that often comes up with questioner children as well as questioner adults, is that they can sometimes seem to others to be disrespectful, impertinent, um, undermining of authority, dis, uh, uh, uncooperative, not team player, because if you get like a defensive boss, they might think, oh, you're asking me question after question. You're really questioning my judgment. You're undermining me, my authority. You're not a team player. Or if I'm a teacher and you're saying to me, why should I learn the multiplication tables if I can look it up on my phone? Why should I learn to write cursive if I'm just going to type? Why should I learn about ancient Mesopotamia? To the questioner, those are legitimate questions that need to be answered. And if you have a teacher who's like, because I say so, because all 10-year-olds have to do it, that is not an acceptable answer. That's the way we've always done it never works for, for a questioner. And many, many questioners have told me about the problems that they had in school because what they considered to be not disrespectful questioning was really misinterpreted by a teacher or a coach or a parent. And so again, it's, what questioners often need to learn is how to ask questions in a way that seem constructive to others and not undermining or disrespectful or slowing down a process in a way that makes other people crazy. Now next, obligers. Obligers are the rock of the world. The, the motto of the obliger is, you can count on me, and I'm counting on you to count on me. Um, they are the type O. They are the universal pair upper. They pair up the best with the other three tendencies. Um, they make great team members, great leaders, great family members, great friends. They are the people who come through. Really, the a lot of the negative consequences or like the frustrations of being an obliger fall on the obligers themselves because they get frustrated because they see that they're following through for other people and they're not following through for themselves. So what's the solution to that? And if there's one idea in the four tendencies that I think has been the most helpful to the most people, here it is. If you were an obliger who readily meets outer expectations but you're struggling to meet your inner expectations, which by definition you are, because that is the definition of an obliger. The answer, the solution, the very simple, easy, and concrete way to fix it is to create outer accountability around that inner expectation. You want to read more? Join a book group. Now what would I say to my, now that I realize that she's an obliger, what would I have said to my friend on the track team? I would have said, absolutely, so you need to work out with a trainer, take a class, work out with a friend who's going to be annoyed if you don't show up. Run with your dog who's going to be so disappointed if he doesn't get to go on his daily run. And by the way, he's going to tear up the furniture. Run, do a charity run where that charity is not going to make as much money if you don't follow through. Think of your duty to be a role model to someone else. Think of your duty um, to, uh, to your future self. There's a million ways to create outer accountability once a person realizes that that is what is necessary. But here's a couple things to remember about creating accountability. 
first of all, obligers very widely in what makes them feel accountable. Um, and so you have to really pay attention to yourself. Some obligers could feel accountable to an auto reminder on their phone. That would be enough. For other obligers, no, they need to get in actual trouble from a real person. Some obligers, um, money, money makes them feel very obligated. Like if they're, if they're gonna pay for something, they're gonna follow through with it. They're not gonna waste that money, but not always. I talked to an obliger and she was saying like, well, yes, I decided that, you know, I needed that outer accountability, so I was gonna work out with a trainer. But then I realized that if I don't show up, he still gets paid and he gets the time back. <laughs> and I was like, let me jump in and suggest that this is not working for you for outer accountability. You need to find another way. This is not for you. Um, and I have been very, very struck by how some obligers are able to um, um, find workarounds. So like one thing that many, um, I've heard from many obligers is they're like, oh, I'm introverted. So the idea of joining an accountability group is like, I, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to go into a group setting or I don't have enough time or, you know, to meet with somebody. So I have this thing called the Better App, and this is a way you can do it online. You could use my app, the Better App, to, to form an accountability group, or there's many ways you can do it on Facebook. Um, there's all kinds of groups that are set up to help with accountability. Um, and I've also been very struck by how many obligers have been able to use what I would consider a very advanced technique, except many, many obligers can do it, so maybe it's easier than it seems to me like it would be, but they almost use imaginary forms of accountability. So again, like now Gretchen doesn't feel like exercising, but future Gretchen will wish that I had exercised. Now Gretchen doesn't feel like showing up to that food pantry, but future Gretchen is really gonna wish that I had, so I should do it. And here's one that I just heard the other day. I thought this was so moving. So a friend of mine is a writer, Alison Gilbert, who writes about um, her experience as, a, she lost her parents very early, so she writes about being a parentless parent. And she's also, an obliger, and she said, I always can spend money on my, hu my husband and my two children, but I could never spend money on myself or do anything for myself. But now I think, that is what my mother would buy for me. If my mother were here, my mother would say, honey, you need to take the day off. So she is able to create her, the idea of her mother as a way to give herself the accountability she needs. It's imaginary, and yet it does feel to her like it is coming to her from the outside. So there's all kinds of ways to create accountability. Now here's another thing about obligers. So under my framework, out, obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. And sometimes obligers explain this dynamic in slightly different language, which I think leads to a lot of mistakes and misconceptions. So sometimes what obligers say is happening, I put others in front of myself. I can take time for other people, but not myself. I can take care of others, but I cannot have self-care. This is a problem, and it leads to a mistake, because what it suggests is, if outer expectations would be washed away, then inner expectations would automatically be met. If I quit my demanding job, then I will fulfill my bucket list. If I retire, then I will be able to do all the things that I've never had time to do. And in my observation, that is not true. It doesn't work like that. For obligers, there must be outer forms of accountability. It's not enough that outer expectations wipe away. Even if they're not there, if there's not outer accountability around an inner expectation, it's not met. So if you want to take care of yourself, create some system of outer accountability around that. That's what works. And then there's obliger rebellion. This is a fascinating, very common pattern um, where an obliger will meet, 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 meet an expectation, and then suddenly they snap. And they're like, this I will not do. And it can be small and kind of funny, like, I'm just not gonna answer your emails for the next two weeks. Um, or it can be big. Uh, a divorce, ending a 20-year friendship, quitting a job and going to work for a competitor. And it happens when obligers feel neglected, exploited, overwhelmed, unheard, um, or when expectations just become too unbearable. And what it took me a long time to understand is that obliger rebellion is really helpful. It is, it's meant to be helpful. It's meant to save the obliger from, from a situation that has become insupportable. And so it blows up the situation. Like all of a sudden you're just like jettisoned out of it. And sometimes that's very positive and helpful, but often it's very destructive. It can be very puzzling to the people around the obligers because they're thinking, well, if you didn't want to do it, why did you say you would do it? 
And like, okay, you're quitting now. Why didn't you ever tell me you had a problem with this? We could have fixed this six months ago. Or, you know, and so it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't seem reasonable. It's not a slow pushback. It's just this explosion. And the blighters themselves will speak of it in those terms. They will say that they are acting out of character. They will set, use terms like I'm a balloon exploding under pressure, a volcano erupting, the lid being blown off a pot. It's, it's a feeling of just explosiveness. Um, and so I think one of the things that we should all do, either as obligers or people around obligers, well, first of all, obligers need themselves to watch out for those feelings of, burning, of building anger and resentment that can lead to obliger rebellion. It's much easier to thwart obliger rebellion than it is to stop it once it starts. I don't even think you can stop it once it starts. It seems like it just needs to run its course. I've never been able, I have never spoken to an obliger who, who felt like they could end it volitionally. It's always like it just has to run its course. But also the people around obligers, we should be watching out for this. Because here's the thing, obligers feel like they're exploited and taken advantage of, and they are 100% correct. This is true. Upholders, questioners, rebels, who do we go to? We go straight for the, for the obliger, because we know that they're the ones that are most likely to say yes. And that's not fair. And so as a manager, you should be looking at your team and be saying, hey, how come a few people are on many committees and most people are on one or two committees? Why is one person doing all the unpleasant work travel and other people are doing none? Why are some people picking up all the extra shifts and some people never help out? You work for me. Why have you never taken a vacation? Um, I have a friend who started a, a business, uh, like a finance business. He had a guy that worked for him who did great work. He said everybody wanted this guy on their team because he made everybody look good. And um, as a consequence, the guy was on many teams. And when he came in for his annual review, my friend, his boss, said, you're doing too much work too well. And I mean that as a sincere criticism. And he took him off some of the teams, not as a punishment, but to say, this isn't sustainable. I don't want to risk losing one of my best employees to burnout and resentment because they're being overexploited like this. So we all should be watching out for this. So how would this play out in your everyday life? So I heard about this. So this was a questioner wife with an obliger husband, and she said, well, I realized it was kind of great because we never did anything on the weekends that he wanted to do. We did all the things that I wanted to get done. You know, and you think, well, this is a good deal. But she was very wise and realized, like, over time, this is not going to play well. So what do you do about that? So she said, I, I, what we did is we talked about it. And now on Friday, we each make a list of the things that we both want to get done. And then we make sure that we do so things from both lists. And he's accountable to me to making his list. And then we do things from both. This is a way that everybody wins. Now, finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. And their motto is, you can't make me, and neither can I. Um, it is the smallest tendency in the world, and it is the longest chapter in the book. Because I think that rebel is the hardest one for the other three tendencies to kind of wrap their minds around. It's a very different way of seeing the world. Um, there is a lot of power in being a rebel. Rebels can do anything they want to do, anything they choose to do. They are in touch with their authentic emotions, ideals. They want to put that out into the world. They're willing to flout convention. They may love to flout convention, but it can be challenging to live or work with somebody who, if you ask or tell them to do something, is very likely to resist. Um, so what do you do? What do you do if you are the rebel and you want to get yourself to do certain things, but the minute that you, you, you know, somebody said, I make a to-do list, and, the minute, and then the minute I have a to-do list, I refuse to do everything on my list. Yeah, you know, I'm like, yes, yes, that's how it would go. Um, and then what if you're dealing with a rebel? What if you have a rebel patient, or a rebel teacher, or a rebel client, or you're dealing with a rebel in the world? How can you communicate with them more effectively? So there's sort of two ways to think about this. One thing to think about is that re for rebels, the idea of identity, is that's a very, very high value. They always want to be true to, their, to who they are. They want to be putting that out into the world. And so you can remind yourself, or you can remind someone else, of who they are. So let's say that you're trying to get yourself to exercise. You could say to yourself, you know, I'm a strong, energetic, athletic person. That is who I am. That's always who I've been. You know, and they try to trap me behind a computer and keep me working under fluorescent lights. 
but they can't stop me from hiking and running and biking, and hey, I'm gonna go for a walk in my lunch hour. You know, um, even though I'm supposed to be answering those emails. You know, so it's this idea of I'm doing what I want, this is who I am, I'm putting it out into the world. Um, sometimes it's hard for uh, rebels to do like regular kind of boring things at the same time every day, but, you could say, but a rebel could say, I'm a reliable, responsible parent. That's who I choose to be. And so I am gonna show up on time to pick up my child from school because I know it's really gonna be upsetting to them if I'm not there, and so I'm going to do that because that's the kind of person that I am. The other thing you can think about is information consequences choice. This is when you give the rebel the information that they need, you tell them the consequences of their action or inaction, and then you let them choose. Um, and so let's say, uh, let's say you have a colleague who is refusing to go to the 10 a.m. Wednesday mandatory staff meeting. Um, and this is causing all kinds of bottlenecks and stuff. So what you could do is you could say, I don't know if you know, but you know, we have this 10 a.m. meeting on Wednesday. And you know what we do at the 10 a.m. meeting on Wednesday is like everybody who's there, like we divvy up the projects for the next couple weeks. We take the good ones and we leave the dregs for all the people who aren't at the meeting. So you know the meeting's at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. Up to you. Um, you know, same thing with sort of in a medical con context. You could say, well, you know, we've done many of these operations and we see two very clear patterns in how, how it turns out. You know, some people take, take their medication, they do their rehab, and we see really good results. They get off their pain medication pretty quick. Um, they can live independently. They don't need people to help them eat or bathe or go to the bathroom. Um, they're, they're very much more independent moving. They don't need a cane or a wheelchair or a walker. You know, they can do whatever they want. They can get onto an airplane. They can do stairs, whatever. You know, they're in really good shape. Uh, people who don't take the medication, don't do the rehab, you know, we see very different outcomes. They tend to have a lot of pain, so they're on pain medication a lot longer. They're often dependent on canes and walkers or wheelchairs. They're not living independently. You know, they need a lot of help with basic life um, tasks. So here are some pamphlets. So the hard thing about this, two things. This is, hard, this is easier said than done. One is you must let, let negative consequences fall on a rebel. If you rescue, if you fix things at the last minute, then that's just working fine the way that it is. You must allow negative consequences to fall. And this can be very, very painful. And if you are somehow paired up with that rebel, this can mean that negative consequences can fall on you as well. But this is just the way of the world. It's like if you, like somebody said to me, well, but if my wife doesn't pay the cable bill, then my cable gets cut off. And I'm like, well, you just have to let that happen. Because if you pay the cable bill at the last minute, then there is no consequence. And the other thing is, this is so important because so many people, so well-intentioned, actually get in the way of a rebel. Do not remind. Do not helpfully hint. <laughs> Do not keep bringing it up. Every time you bring it up, you're going to ignite that spirit of resistance. And so a rebel might perfectly well want to do something, and the more you remind them to do it, the more you make them not do it. And this is not a joke. This is something that many, many rebels will say. They're like, I was going to do it until he reminded me. I was going to do it until she said I should do it. I had somebody who said that their rebel boss had a whole plan in place until corporate came down with the same plan, in which case the rebel changed everything. Um, and here, one of the most interesting examples of this was, um, so um, uh, Mark mentioned that my, I have a podcast with my sister, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, and we sometimes take listener questions, and just by chance, in one week, we got the same question, essentially, from two different people. They were two people who were, had rebel sweethearts. So one um, was a woman whose rebel sweetheart was going to come, move from his city to her city, and hadn't looked for work in her city yet. And the other was a woman whose husband had been uh, made redundant, and he was not looking for work yet. And so both of these people had said, what can I do to, to be helpful to help my rebel look for work? And my answer to this was so radical that I actually called a friend of mine who's a rebel, and I was like, is this the right answer? Because it's pretty bold. And she said, 100%, that's the right answer. And the answer, what should you do? Nothing. 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 Do not make an Excel spreadsheet of phone numbers. <laughs> Do not make a timeline and post it on the fridge. Don't keep bringing it up. Hey, look, wouldn't today be a great day to email what's-his-face? Say nothing. These guys know they need a job. The more you remind them, the more you could ignite that spirit of resistance. 
so stay back. Last two interesting things about rebels, and then I will t uh, make a few kind of broad uh, observations about um, the tendencies, and then we'll have the conversation. Um, one is interesting, many, some rebels are t attracted to areas of high regulation, the military, the clergy, the police, large corporations with lots of rules. It's, and I was very puzzled by this, but what rebels have explained to me is they, they sometimes need something to push against. That some rebels are fine on their own, but some need something to like give them something to rebel against, and that's how they, they find energy. And another thing is, if there is a rebel who's paired up, either in romance or at work, like let's say you have a founding team of a company, almost always the rebel is paired with an obliger. That is overwhelmingly the pattern that you see. So if there is a rebel somewhere, there's probably an obliger right, right next to them. And just sort of a few, a few basic things about the four tendencies. One is I really do think these are hardwired. I don't think you're one at 20 and one at 40. I don't think you're one at work at one at home. But this is, these are only a very narrow aspect of your personality. So we could take 50 questioners and line them up. And when we thought about how ambitious they were, how considerate of other people's feelings they were, how analytical they were, how curious they were, how intellectual they were, how extroverted or introverted they were, how controlling they were, how neurotic they were, all these things can be completely different. The only thing that the tendency tells you is if you ask her to, to tell them, uh, ask or tell them to do something, what do they say? And what do they say is, why should I? Um, that they would all answer in chorus. Other than that, they're completely different. So you can't overgeneralize about anybody. You don't have a picture in your head if all you know is their tendency. Um, that said, I do believe everybody's in a core tendency, but every tendency tips, uh, I mean, every tendency overlaps with two other tendencies, so you can tip one way or the other. So say I'm an upholder, which I am, but upholders have a lot in common with obligers because we both meet outer expectations. And upholders have a lot in common with questioners because we both meet inner expectations. And so you can be an upholder who tips to obliger, an upholder who tips to questioner, and all around uh, all four tendencies. And so that kind of gives you a flavor, it changes kind of the atmosphere of how your tendency comes out. Um, now I really do think that the tendencies are helpful, both allowing us to show compassion for ourselves and for other people. And it allows us to show compassion for ourselves because a lot of people, are, they're like, something's wrong with me. Things are easy for other people that are hard for me. I have no self-control, I have no willpower, I'm lazy. And it's like, no you're not. No matter which of these you fall into, you have a lot of company. There are many people who are having a lot, uh, experiencing very much the same frustrations you are. There are many strategies that people have figured out in order to work around this. So sometimes people are like, well I want to change my tendency. And I'm always like, you don't need to change your tendency. You just have to figure out how to work around it. Each tendency, you can harness great strengths, and then you just have to figure out how to manage the, the weaknesses and the limitations to get you where you want. Because, I mean, is it even possible to change your deep inner nature? I mean, if it is possible, it's really hard, and maybe it's not even possible. So I'm like, take the easy shortcut. So you can show more compassion to yourself, because it's like, okay, I'm like this, so what? A lot of people are like this. And the other thing is that it lets us show more compassion for other people. Because it's not that you're right and I'm wrong, or that I'm right and you're wrong, it's just that we have different perspectives. So we're th we, we see things in different ways. And we can figure out ways to talk about it in a way that's non-judgmental, that's not personal, where it's like, okay, just given what we know about each other and what our values are and how we tend to approach things, how do we figure out a way that works for everyone? So for example, if I had a team that had a bunch of different tendencies in it and I was introducing a new software that we were gonna be using because corporate told us to, I might say, I'm gonna give you a short presentation, and once that presentation is over, I could say, and if you would like to stay, because you would like me to answer more questions about why we're using this software, I am happy to stay and answer your questions. If you feel like you've heard enough about this software, and you would like to return to your desk, please feel free to go now. So this way, it's like, the people who really need a lot of questions answered, get their questions answered, but they don't drain and overwhelm others who, who don't need to hear all that. You know, you can figure out ways to work around it. And also you can figure, you just understand why you don't need to take things personally. And here I'll give an example just very close to my own experience. So I'm an upholder married to a questioner, and in many ways I admire and respect and try to imitate it, and in many ways it drives me totally crazy. Um, and uh, so I call, so there, there was this very boring bureaucratic form to be filled out, and in true upholder fashion I was like, 
I'm just gonna go ahead and fill out this form because I wanna just get it done and cross it off the list and if I waited for my husband to do it, who knows when he'll decide the time is right. So I'm just gonna fill it out. So I start filling it out and it asked me for his work address, which I did not know. So I called him up and I said, what's your work address? And he said, why do you wanna know? And in a previously unenlightened state, I would have said, what do I want to know? What do you think? Am I going to send you flowers? Why is everything a discussion? Why can't you answer a simple question? What does this mean about a relationship? You know, because I just wanted to get through it. But now I know better. I know perfectly well what I should have said. I know him. It's not about me. He's like this with everyone. It's totally predictable. And what I should have said, and what I will say next time is, hey, honey, I'm filling out that boring bureaucratic form. What's your work address? And then he would have told me. Because the fact is, I wouldn't have needed the explanation, but I know that he does. So fun. So in this way, I think it can really help us engage with other people more effectively because we have a vocabulary in which to communicate why certain things do or don't work or why certain things set our teeth on edge or, or make it easier or harder for us to do something. And the last thing I'll say, and then, and then we'll, we'll t I'll talk to Mark, is you know, I really do believe that everything that leads us towards self-knowledge really can uh, make us happier, healthier, more productive, and more creative, because when we know ourselves, we can build a life that reflects our true values, our true nature, our true interests. Um, and once we're happy, then it becomes much easier to turn outward and to think about how to make other people happy too. So thank you. Gretchen, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure, like me, you've all got lots of um, questions. That was fascinating. Uh, and even though I've heard the framework before and been listening to a lot of your work for many years, I still take something new from it every time, so thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to take a step back slightly because where many of us, I think, who, who would have first come across your work might have been, for example, in your Happiness Project book, where really I think what you're exploring is what many of us ask ourselves in our life, with it, which is what, what is it that really contributes to a a happy life, what kind of things can we do that make a difference? And the thing that struck me most when you moved on to your work after that was what seemed to me a realisation that it's all very well knowing you know, the things that might make us happy, you know, relationships and exercise and meditation or whatever it is, but if we don't find our own personal mechanism for making it happen, it's kind of meaningless. Yeah, you know, you right. can know how, as much as you like how good it is to meditate, but if you've never found time to meditate, then yeah. it's kind of irrelevant. So it feels to me the more I read your work, and indeed the, the work we do with Action for Happiness and my own experience, that it feels like this habits, this, this how we behave on a daily basis is, is, the, is the very building block of, of a good life and for ourselves and others. Is, is that your experience, that habits no, are under and everything? A hundred percent. That's exactly... So in my book, Better Than Before, I, I talk about the 21 strategies of how we can make or break habits. And that's how I found the four tendencies is because that turned out to be one of the aspects of how people could effectively change their habits. But th the reason that I got interested in habits is exactly the reason that you would say because so often... The, the, the problem for most people wasn't that they, didn't, they had no idea what would make them happy. Usually they did have an idea, but they were having trouble following through. And, and when I looked at the kind of behaviors that people talked about, very often they were things that they wanted to do indefinitely. They wanted to exercise. They wanted to work on their creative fiction. They wanted to practice a, a, a musical instrument. They wanted to quit sugar. They wanted to go to bed on time. They wanted to spend less time on their devices. These are really habits. It's not like a one-time thing that they were trying to do. It was habits. And so then I absolutely, I turned my, my attention to, okay, once we know we want to do something, how is it that we turn it into a habit? Because once it's a habit, then it's become so much easier. It just, it's on autopilot. We don't have to use our willpower or make decisions, which is so tiring and exhausting. It's just, we just, it's like, you know, brushing your teeth. Do you say to yourself, you know, well, I've been so good about brushing my teeth. I think I deserve a day off. Or I'm going to be so good about brushing my teeth starting January 1st. It doesn't matter what I do today. Or on a beautiful day today, who's got the time to brush their teeth? Or, oh, maybe, maybe it'll bother my husband if I brush my teeth in here if I'm loud. I think I better go to bed without brushing my teeth out of concern for him. I mean, we don't do that. We just g g do it. And so I think that's one of the reasons that habits can be helpful. That's, that's something that I certainly found, again, inspired by your work, which is a, a sort of realization that 
Um, when something goes from being a conscious choice, yes. like, do I or don't I eat this unhealthy right. cake, or do yeah. I or don't I go and work out today, or right. whatever, uh, into a, no, I've got a default response yes. to this. And so when somebody you know, asks me a certain type of question, I tend to respond in this way, or when I get offered, you know, yeah cake between meals, right. I tend to say, no, I find yes. that actually incredibly liberating in terms yes. of this frees up cognitive space yes. because you're not making decisions all the time. It, it, but is that because of the particular tendency I am or do you think that's, that's true for all of us? No, I think that's true for habits in general. I mean, and that's why the brain forms habits. It's in order to simplify life so that there is more kind of bandwidth available to anything that's novel or unexpected or challenging. So if you put things on autopilot, then... Um, you don't have to, you can think about other things. And so it's like, if you've had the experience of like you're going to work and you're like, oh, I have no recollection of even doing here. And that's one of the negatives of habits. One of the negatives of habit is it can kind of deaden. It can speed time and it can make you less aware of what you're doing. Um, but, but sort of that's also the advantage because you could be thinking about, you don't, because you don't have to think about the order in which you put on your clothes. You can be thinking about like a big challenging conversation that you have to have with your child or something like that. So, but there's an interesting tension here between um, sort of habitual behavior and self-awareness. Because again, yeah. one of the things yes. I've been struck with with your framework is that the starting point to act on am I an obliger or a rebel or anything is just the, the self-awareness to recognize your own tendencies. And you've given us some helpful ways of thinking about you know, how we would respond to things. But, it feels to me that the step one here is a bit of a, an awareness to how, I do, how do I respond and yes. interact with others and what does, yeah. how do I motivate myself. And, and I was reminded in listening to you of one of the things I've always felt the wisest people taught me in a, in a workplace context, which is real leadership is about adapting your style to the, the differences mm. in the people amongst you. And you yeah. gave some nice examples of that. But it feels to me that in some ways we need to adapt our style to ourselves yes. and to each other yes. with a bit more awareness of, you know, so how does this person tick? Is no, that... 100%. And one of the things that's really helpful in that way is I think it's very hard to know ourselves. Like you think, well, I just hang out with myself all day. Of course I know myself. But it's like it's very hard to know ourselves because we're so blinded by what, the way we wish we were or what other people expect us to be. And one of the most obvious ways where I see this come up is with morning people and night people. So there really is morning. How, there really are morning people or night people. Um, morning people are at their most creative and energetic and productive earlier in the day, and you know night people at night. And it's largely a function of genetics um, and also age. Um, but this is a real thing. Now, how Can many people here would say? Yeah, how yeah. many people are morning people? And how many people are night people? So that's a lot of nine people, right? But a lot of times, like the experts will say things like, if you want to get things done, you need to get up early and exercise, you know, an hour before work. And then people are like, but I can't do that. And I'm like, well, yeah, because you're a night person. Like, you probably can only get to work, but like barely on time. Don't try to, don't try to make yourself a morning person. Figure out a different time to work out. Because a lot of times people, they, they, they are blaming themselves, but they haven't set things up in the way that's right for them. Mm. Um, if you're a night person, the idea that you're going to get up and work on your novel be, like at 6 a.m., you're setting yourself up for failure because that's not when you're at a creative and productive mm -hmm. time. Same thing, like, I would never expect myself, like, oh, you should work on your side project from 10 to 11 p.m. It's not going to happen because I'm on my downslide hard by that time. So, so I, I, I love the... Um the concept that you talk about in Better Than Before about strategies, which I know yeah. sort of led to this tendencies idea, but you know, having different sort of conscious approaches to, to dealing with things. One that particularly resonated with me, and I can't remember where I first heard about it, but I know you've talked about it before, is this idea of bundling things together. Yeah, pairing. So if somebody wants to exercise more um, but can't motivate themselves but, you know, loves watching their favourite TV show, then can oh. they go to the gym and only let themselves watch the TV show whilst on the running well, machine? Well, this is my sister so, who... For a long time, she could, she could exercise successfully at home because she would only watch The Real Housewives while right. she was on TV. She's obsessed with The Real Housewives. There's a lot of Real Housewives. Like, if you want to watch that show, you can get a lot of exercise. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and so it worked really well for her for a long time. And then her TV broke, and it's a whole long story. So, but, so I, um, I was yeah. intrigued as to what your own personal favorite strategy is, having done lots of this oh, now. Right. If you had to pick out a couple of examples of your own things that have really helped, what well, would you Well, you know, um, one of the strategies that works for me that works for just about everyone, it's the twin strategies of the strategy of convenience and the strategy of inconvenience. And so anything you want to get yourself to do, you want to make it as convenient as possible, and anything you don't want to do, you want to make it inconvenient. Like earlier, you were mentioning that if you didn't want to use your phone, you would leave it in the kitchen yeah. instead of taking it to your bedroom. You know, or, or you can even, um, or, you know, if somebody was like, oh, I always am texting in the car, which is like terrifying. But I was like, put it in the trunk or the boot, you know. 
you don't have it on the seat next to you because you will, you will check that phone. Like, don't try to work on your willpower. Make it so inconvenient or impossible. Um, I've heard from a surprising number of people. I, I had never thought of this, but it seems like quite popular. People who sleep in their exercise clothes so that in the morning they don't have to change their clothes. They just go right. I'm like, wow. that works. That works. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about the strategy, <laughs> about the tendencies and the strategies is that some strategies work really, really well for some people and don't work at all for other people. And so you should never beat yourself up if something doesn't work. So for instance, as upholders, one of the things about upholders is they tend to love schedules and calendars and to-do lists, they like that. But rebels don't. Rebels like to be spontaneous. Rebels don't like to feel locked in. And so if you're a rebel and people keep saying to you things like, you just need to put it on the calendar and you need to sign up for a class. You know, it's like, and you, that doesn't work for you. Right, that would not work for you. So that is something that works extremely well for me. Doesn't work that well for rebels. Um, but, like, but, but another strategy that works for just about everyone is the strategy of clarity, which is what exactly are you expecting from yourself? Like what, what is the exact form that that thing would take? Because sometimes we want, we're like, my habit that I want to form is to eat healthier. What does that mean? It sounds specific, but it's actually quite general. So you want to really like get clarity. I am, I am going to pack a lunch from home. I'm going to cook four nights a week. I'm going to quit sugar, I'm going to, you know, whatever it might be, but you want to say to yourself exactly what you're expecting of yourself, and that makes it a lot easier to follow through. Or like, I'm going to enjoy the moment. How, what does that mean? Like, how would you do that? I mean, um, I, one of the things I like to do to enjoy the moment is to like really look at colors. Like really, I try to like really connect to colors in the world or really to connect to smell. Some people I know have an app that like randomly chimes at them to call them to the moment. I've got to say, nothing would do less for my peace of mind than having my phone randomly chime at me, but some people it works. So again, it's like whatever works for you. Um, but having that clarity, like what is it that you expect from yourself? What are you That's asking really, yourself? really helpful. I remember when I, when I first started um, practicing meditation, and found it hard to make it a habit. It was when somebody suggested, what's the thing you do every morning mm -hmm. that you can make part of this? So it's like, put the kettle on to make a coffee, try and do that mindfully, and then just take a moment, even that's not the same as sitting there calmly right. for 10 minutes. It was a moment of like, okay, every day when I do yeah. this, I've got right. a little hook. So to, that's piggybacking to, too, which yeah. is where you look, one, you, yeah. Yeah, Great. absolutely. So, so you, you did at the start a thing that helped us, or you asked questions that allowed us to sort of identify, I think, with one of the four things. I guess one of the things that's been on my mind is when, when we're interacting with colleagues, loved ones, people we meet, and we're, we're thinking to ourselves, oh, I wonder what mm -hmm. their tendency mm -hmm. is. Is there, a, is there a, aside from saying, hey, can you just fill in this yeah, yeah, survey? Yeah. <laughs> are, um, there, are there easy questions? Are there ways questions? that we can find this out? Well, there's certain words that if you hear these words, you're like, okay, I think I know what I'm dealing with here. Um, now, maybe because I'm an upholder, I'm blind to it, so I don't know what the word for upholder is, but one word that will often come up in conversation if you're dealing with a questioner is arbitrary. This is like anything that is arbitrary will drive them crazy, and they will think things are arbitrary is like, why is there one speed limit for everyone? Or why are there five garments in a dressing room? Like, this makes no sense, it's totally arbitrary. Why is this due by Friday? You're not going to look at it till Tuesday. That's just like an arbitrary day. So when they say arbitrary, I think questioner. Um, anytime someone talks about self-care or the need to put themselves first or the fact that they can't do something because they're doing something for other people, it's like, I, can't, I, don't, I have no time to exercise because I have to give all my time to my patients. That kind of, that kind of talk is obliger. Um, and then anytime somebody talks about spontaneity, rebels get there very fast. Like, they really value spontaneity. So those are some things. But if you can actually ask them a question, there are a couple questions you can ask. One is, there's a sign here that says no cell phone. We're in a coffee shop. We're in the back room of a coffee shop. There's nobody really around. There's a big sign that says no cell phone use. And I pull out my cell phone and I start using it. How do you feel about it? So an upholder would be like, oh, I, I wish you would not use your cell phone because that, it says no cell phone use. <laughs> and questioners would be like, well, why is there a rule? Like, if we're in a hospital and it's going to interfere with equipment, I get it. But if there's no reason for the rule, you're not interrupted. But it's like, why would, no, you don't have to follow that rule. Obligers would be like, well, is this going to bother anybody? Or is like the wait staff going to get you in trouble? Like, is anybody, who's checking on us? Like, why is, like, how would it affect uh, others? And then a rebel would be like, awesome, I'm going to take a picture of you standing in front of that sign. <laughs> using your That's awesome. Because um, we don't have to, like, who cares what the sign says? 
Another question you could use is how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? This is not do you keep New Year's resolutions, it's how do you feel about New Year's resolutions. Upholders will typically say that they like resolutions, they make them at the New Year, they make them whenever they want, they, they like them, they have good success with them. Questioners will say, well, I would, I would keep a resolution when it made sense for me, but I would not wait for January 1st because January 1st is oh, arbitrary. Sure. It's an arbitrary date. Um, obligers will often say that they've given up making New Year's resolutions because they've made them and failed to keep them so often that they refuse to make them anymore. <laughs> and rebels will typically say something. They will either say they wouldn't make a resolution because they don't like to chain themselves or bind themselves in advance, or sometimes they like them because they like to challenge. Like, hey, you know, you say I can't run the marathon in 2018? Well, watch me. Or, like, my wife says that I can't go without alcohol for a whole year? Well, I'm going to show her. You know, so sometimes they do it kind of in that spirit. But they wouldn't do it in kind of like, a, like anything that could conceive, like a chaining of themselves. So those are two questions that give you like a mm. quick feeling. Thank you. Um, whenever I've done anything sort of personality-wise, whether it's the classic kind of, you know, um, openness, agreeableness, uh, conscientiousness, oh, right, right, all that right. kind of stuff, or Myers-Briggs, or any of these things, one of the things I'm interested in is, is the combinations of personalities in, in, in teams or in couples. I would imagine you quite rarely see couples that are exactly the same tendency because mm -hmm. of this, this complementarity that we often look for in choosing partners. And I, I wonder if you've ever looked at the combinations that you'd find in teams. I, I was amused and not entirely surprised to see when I reached out to our own small Action for Happiness team and said, hey, you might want to try... Um, seeing what you are, that um, you know, the questioner came back saying, "I completely question that this is valid." Yeah, and the, yeah, and the yeah, rebel yeah, yeah. Why should I waste my time taking this Even filling in the survey. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. what have you noticed about the sort of combinations of people and the dynamics in, in relationships, and how this can work and not work? Well, so in relationships, and, and in, 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 I mean, the one pattern that you really do overwhelmingly see is the one that I mentioned, which is the the rebel pairing with an obliger. Other than that, you know, as I said, so many things, there's so many things that come into play that it's hard to say, like, every team should have two questioners and one obliger and one rebel or whatever because it matters so much what else is mixed with that. So, like, a rebel who's really ambitious, really considerate about other people's feelings and really prides themselves on being, like, a responsible person is going to be very different from a rebel who doesn't really care about other people's feelings and doesn't really care about getting it, you know, like, doing a good job. And so it's hard to make generalizations. Mm. But I will say that obligers are the ones that tend to pair up most easily with others. And also, the, a difficult pair, a difficult combination in any kind of context is a polar rubble. They really, they are the polar uh, tendencies. They are extreme personality types, typically. And they, they just see the world in very fundamentally different ways. And so often, that is tough. It's tough if you have like a rebel boss and an upholder employee or uh, uh, an upholder boss and a rebel employee, or you know, or or in a family, that can be really hard. One of the people, th one of the groups that I hear about from the most is people who are the parents of rebel children who don't, who want to understand how to communicate with a, a, a with a rebel. Because um, and, and many people have said to me, I'm glad that I'm a rebel with a rebel child because I don't know that somebody who isn't a rebel would understand how to deal with it. So. Um, I found that yeah. really helpful myself, actually, in, in since reading this work and thinking about my relationship with my own sister, who I think uh, she's a self-confessed rebel, and the things that I'd done, I think, with the intention to, yes. to help her, I think, have been counterproductive. Well, and you I know, think that's and, it. It's like the, what your instinct to do as an upholder is exactly wrong, and, like, and their instinct to us is not right either. Like, sometimes what people will say to an upholder is, is things like, you know, yeah, you should take some time off. Don't go for a run today. You should just, like, have a big piece of cake, play hooky, take it easy, like, spend the day on the couch watching TV. To an upholder, that's, like, not reassuring. That's, like, oh, my gosh, that's, like, feels so chaotic, and then, like, I'm letting myself down, and it, it doesn't feel good. You know, I mean, and so um, this idea that, like, <laughs> get, you, and so it, it's, just a, it's just a very different way of seeing the world. But I would never say that it could never work because, it, again, it depends so much on all the other um, elements that are in it, and of course, if you eliminate one of these categories, you're really cutting off a very important aspect of, of what needs to happen. And so, um, they all have a lot to contribute, um, but it might be, in some circumstances, you would really want to have a lot of rebels, because it would suit them really well. Um, and in some sort, like sales, for instance. Rebels also do, often do well in something like sales where it's like, you're going out and you're making calls, every day is different, 
It's like, hey man, you can do whatever you need to do to make that sale. Like that's that works well for a rebel. But you know, and then like in a, if, if you're like working in a really um, highly regulated industry, you know, legal contracts or something like that, it might not that a rebel couldn't do that or that an upholder couldn't be a good salesman, but it's just like certain things tap more readily into that tendency. Thank you. Just one final um, discussion point before I open up to the audience, so please do have your questions ready in a moment. Um, I was thinking, as a parent of young children, um, both about your point about the genetic component to this, but also about the extent to which we might be, it might be beneficial in the same way we adapt our style as a leader or a colleague to think about the way we parent differently with yes. children with depending on their tendencies. So first of all, do you think that parenting styles shape the tendencies of, your, of children, through, you know, as well as the genetics, as the conditioning that makes them more likely to be a rebel or makes them more likely to be an upholder? And, and secondly, as a parent, do you think it's very wise to be thinking about this mm. um, in the context of your children, or in fact, is there a danger of us pigeonholing people at an mm. early age? Right, and so right, what's right, your right. views on that? Well, that's, many people talk about that with all kind of personality frameworks, which is this sort of idea, if you define me, you can find me, and like, is it bad to give people labels? Does it limit their sense of possibility or growth, or does it cause people to react to them in a kind of a very stereotyped way? I mean, my own view is that it's helpful to have these, these kind of shortcuts that have a vocabulary, um, but th it isn't meant to limit someone's possibilities, but just to like, shine a spotlight. Um, as to children, um, I really do believe that this is just something that you bring into the world, so I don't think that you could, by your parenting style, I I unless it's an extremely kind of very extreme and dysfunctional situation, I don't think you would change someone's tendency. Um, uh, though I think probably you would parent differently depending on, you know, because, because just while you're parenting the child, like they're giving you a lot, you're reacting to them quite, quite strongly. And of course an environment is going to shape the way it comes out or how you express it. If you're a questioner and you're growing up in North Korea, you're going to learn to tamp that down. If you're a questioner growing up in Silicon Valley, you know, you might be quite praised for that. And so it would, ex it, 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 it's absolutely true that your circumstances are going to influence how it comes out. You know, if you are a questioner child who has a questioner parent, well, that questioner parent might be very, very happy to sit down and explain the reason behind every single rule. And then, um, whereas if you had somebody, a different tendency, they might be like, you ask too many questions, this, you, know, you know, why are you always bothering me with this stuff? Like, just do it because I say so. Um, they, you know, but I don't think that they would change that child from being a questioner, but they might have a lot more frustration and difficulty mm -hmm. if they didn't understand, like, you just got to sit down and have that conversation with a, with a questioner. Thank you. I, I think so, as with so many things in life, a combination of self-awareness yes. and empathy goes 100%. a long way. 100%. Yeah. That that's the magic um, combo. Like, easier said than done, yeah. right? Um, Gretchen, thank you. It's lovely to have this conversation. I'm sure many more great things will emerge. So we've got some microphones, folks. I'd love to kind of allow you to ask uh, questions. And yeah. so let's respect each other by trying to keep them um, brief. And there's a lady very enthusiastically with her hand up at the back. So let's start over there and let's come down and take this one at the front afterwards. Fiona, thank Excellent. You. Okay. Over Hi. to you, Gretchen. I was just wondering if you can, if there's a transition between the tendencies, because I've got, a, I've definitely got a rebel child, a 19 year old. And I think I'm an obliger, but I feel like I'm turning into a rebel, and my obliging nature might be turning her from a rebel into an obliger. So can it transition through the age? Wait, wait, so, wait so you feel like, say that again? The, the I've got a rebel 19-year-old. I've hmm? got a rebel 19. I think, I think I'm an obliger. I'm not 100% sure. And the question was, can, do, do people can, can it transition? Is there a transition? Oh, 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 right. Is there obliger such a thing? Because I think she's... Typically, a rebel from quite a young age, but she's also a teenager, and I don't, I actually don't want to, the rebel, the rebel to, I don't want her to lose the rebel, because it's so kind of, I like it, being an obliger, I like it, but I think, as an obliger, I'm turning a bit into a rebel. Okay, right, so right. So, I just want, I've seen the transition, I wondered if it was transitional. Well, typically, I think people really stay within a tendency for their whole lives, um, now, sometimes people really go through a massive personality-altering event, something like a major brush with death, a long bout of addiction, um, medication that has like fundamental, uh, makes a fundamental difference in how someone's personality is expressed. So sometimes then you sort of see a difference in a tendency. Now, if you say you're an obliger who's feeling more like you're, you're getting your rebel on, that's absolutely something, that's obliger rebellion. And so obligers will often go through that. And I, and I have spoken to many obligers who are almost in like full body, full time obliger rebellion. 
Um, it doesn't have the same quality as true rebel. True rebels don't care. They're like, whatever, man. You can talk to me all you want. I'm, not, I'm gonna do my own thing. But an obliger, the rebellion is coming from this anger, this pushing back, this feeling of being shoved around. It's very different in its quality. It has that rebel aspect to it, but I don't think an obliger really becomes a rebel. I think they go into an obliger rebellion, which is a little bit different. Now, it's interesting that you say about your child. Now, see, people will often say to me things like, well, all little kids are questioners, or all toddlers are rebels. <laughs> They're really not. <laughs> when you see the real thing, you know. Um, you know, they might have a period where they're asking a little more questions or where they're like having a tantrum because they, they don't have executive function. But I think you really do see a difference in the four. Um, now, some children you don't know early because children are not autonomous like adults are. Some tendencies with children, it's very easy to spot very, very early. Some child, my, my daughter is 18 and it's only now that it's clear to me she's a questioner. It took me a really long time to figure that out. So sometimes you can't really figure it out. But I mean, but, but, but if someone, uh, I don't think that usually you would say that they're this tendency at one age and then they're switching to another. And, and part of it is that we don't know what somebody is from the outside. We have to know what they're thinking from the inside. One, one obliger said to me, well, everybody would have thought I was a rebel in high school because I was doing exactly what my friends expected me to do. <laughs> right? So, so again, it's like you don't always know what's going on in some, on, in, what's inside someone's head. Next? Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, hi. My name is Sam. Thank you very much for this uh, for this talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I have a quick question. It might be similar to hers as well, but um, I feel like I'm a spontaneous person. So sometimes I don't like to plan things. Like I like to just just do like last minute. Call my friend. Let's hang out. Let's go for dinner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But sometimes at the same time, I feel that I like to look at my calendar and my phone and know okay. what my days look like during the week because I feel right. like it makes me more organized. And so I keep. I like that as well. Okay, but so that is just like an, like an incidental kind of often consequence. So let me ask you, if, I, if someone asks you to, or tells you to do something, what's your response? Are you more, more likely to think, yes, I should do it, or are you gonna think, why should I, or do you think you can't make me? Well, I mean, it depends like in what context or who it is that's asking Okay, you're me. a questioner. <laughs> <laughs> So it goes, thank you, thank you. So it goes to what I, was, what I wanted to essentially ask you is basically that, so I feel like sometimes it's really hard for me to do things. Like for example, I tell myself, I tell myself okay, I'm gonna go to bed early tonight so I can wake up early so I can do this and this and that. But then I never get the, I never go to bed on time and I end up waking, get, waking up late and so it bothers me and then okay. throughout the day like it, it affects me so and I, I sometimes experience anxiety because I feel like I'm disorganized so I don't know if you have any suggestions mm -hmm. for right. me Thank yeah you. absolutely whenever a questioner is having trouble following through with a habit like you're having trouble following through with the habit of going to sleep on time what I would really say is, again, as I was talking about clarity, the strategy of clarity. The strategy of clarity is the most important strategy for questioners, this would make sense. So I would challenge you to say, have you really thought through when you're gonna go to sleep, why you're gonna go to sleep then, exactly when are you gonna go to sleep? Because if you're just like, I should go to sleep early tonight, but now I feel like staying up and watching television, it's like that's not clear enough. You have to be like, I know that most adults need at least seven hours of sleep. So if I know I'm getting up at six o'clock, then I have to get up at this time. And so if I know that I need a half an hour to get ready for bed, then I'm gonna set my alarm at this time. Oh, and then I discover when I'm learning about myself that I actually do better. I fall asleep faster if I go to sleep at 11 instead of 10.30. And so now I'm gonna go to bed at 11. For questioners, what works is real justification, real reasons for exactly what they're doing, and then customizing it for themselves always finding the best way for themselves. Maybe monitoring would help. I would encourage you to get one of these things, a sleep tracker. Questioners are often attracted to that kind of thing because it's information. Uh, as you have more information about what you're doing and more justification, like a general kind of like, I should go to bed earlier is not gonna do the trick. Push yourself to come up with the exact, really think through your reasons. Because once a questioner feels those reasons, and like maybe you actually don't want to get up early. A lot of people say they want to get up early. They don't really want to get up early. I mean, do you really want to get up early? You don't really want to get up early. <laughs> so, you know, so I would say that's the challenge for questioners is the why. 
why? And why not? You know, like maybe you don't need to. Okay. Um, so, yeah, how about that? Hi, my name's Caroline. Thank you for coming to London. I was so excited. And oh, I realised yesterday afternoon. Um, my question probably follows on a little bit from the previous gentleman. Um, so I'm a questioner. Um, and I think I tip a bit towards rebellion as well. Yeah. Um, but I'm getting quite frustrated because I'm a questioner. I need to find out more. And I can't quite pinpoint the chapters in your book and on oh. the website. And, <laughs> what it is that's driving me. So an example would be, um, so I want clarity, I want the to-do list, I write it all down, and then I see the to-do list, and then I start freaking out, I don't want to do that, well, I, right. I don't want to do that. And, and I feel very conflicted, and I can't quite pinpoint, maybe it comes back to the clarity thing, I don't know, but, or perhaps it's things that, there are things on there that make sense to me and I feel comfortable about it, and things that are on there that are for other people and they're for, you know, they don't meet my expectations. I'm not sure. Is well, are the things that you're having trouble following through, are they things that you feel like don't really make sense but that you just have to do for other people? Yeah, I guess so, and just maybe just don't excite me. Right there, me. right? Just, I mean... Yeah, they just don't excite me. They what? <laughs> they don't excite me. I don't get, you know... So it sounds like you're having a why should I? Yeah. Why should I? Yes. Yeah. 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 No, that's a very, very powerful thing for questioners. Why should I? Okay. And so that's when you're kind of, that's where kind of the, the, the pull apart between the obligers and questioners was coming in. So you're feeling like you should do them, but you're like, well, why should I? Um, so maybe you want to look at the list and see if these are things that you really think that are justified for you. Okay. Because um, just putting it on the list isn't going to make you want to do it if you don't in your, in your heart think that they're worth doing. Yeah. I guess if there's, there's no justification. The, and sometimes there's, you know, some, the life is just, you know, there you are just, things that you just, that I just have to do. That you just have to do. So in that case, what questioners can do is they can really focus on the second level of justification. So the first level of justification is like, I'm going to do this assignment because it's going to help me learn, right? Or I'm going to do this, I'm going to go to this school meeting because it's going to give me good information. Okay, but a lot of times you're like, well, but this assignment is dumb. It's going to waste my time. It's not going to teach me anything. Or I'm going to, I know I'm going to go to this meeting and I'm going to get nothing out of it. It's just a big waste of my time. But you can say, but there's another reason that I'm going to do it. So I think that this assignment is dumb, but I'm going to do it because it's really important for me to win the respect of this professor because his recommendation is going to be very important for me when I apply to medical school. So I'm not doing it because I believe in the value of the assignment itself, but I'm doing it for a second reason, which is that I need to be in good graces of this professor. I'm not going to go to the school thing because I think that it's going to be a good use of my time, but I want to show my child that if there's a meeting at school, I go because the school is very important, it's a high value in my life, and I want to show that to my child. That's my second order of justification. And so sometimes for, for, for questioners, they can get very stuck on some, something feeling inefficient or senseless or unjustified or a big waste, and then they kind of stall out there. But if you remember, well, there is another reason. Or like, I'm going to get fired. Or like, it's going to affect my bonus. Or this is really important to somebody else. So, you know, uh, you, you know somebody said, like, my, my grandmother always doesn't like for me to wear pants. She's like, and I think that's the dumbest thing ever, but it's important for me to make my grandmother happy. So when I'm around her, I don't wear pants because... I want to make my grandmother happy. And so I'm doing it because it's important to somebody else. So sometimes you can look I at feel, I feel an urge to clarify the American <laughs> and, um, and British distinctions of the oh, word Oh, right. Just this is like, yes. Trousers, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Trousers. Um, Gretchen, Hopefully your grandmother would not be <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Trousers. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's a whole different tendency going okay, on Okay, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Trousers. I, Trousers. Um, I, I'm struck at this point Thank you for not giggling. That's very <laughs> mature. I, I'm, um, I was wondering, and it kind of makes sense in some ways, but I'm wondering how often when you do Q&A sessions is it the questioners that ask you the questions? Is that correct? Um, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, you know, it, it's funny. That's a good question. I should pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just asked a question myself. There you go. There you go. Back to the um, people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Gretchen. Thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, how do the four tendencies link to the introvert, extrovert personality types? Have you mm. noticed, like, for example, are rebels more extrovert or are obligers more introvert? Have you noticed any linkages mm. between the, the different frameworks? 
Um, well, you know, this is where I would love to have like big, big data where we could run tons and tons and see if there was some kind of correlation. I have to say sort of from my anecdotal observation, uh, anecdata, data, my favorite data, um, there doesn't seem to be a correlation. Um, that, you know, you see, you see people who are extroverted or introverted um, among all the four tendencies. Now, it, could, it would be very interesting to know if you really looked at giant populations, would these kind of interesting patterns observe, um, um, kind of emerge? It might be, uh, but not so far that I can tell. It seems like it's, it seems like it's, it's not correlated. Okay, thanks. Uh, here. Oh, the guy in the red shirt. Yeah, I know it's hard to point, sorry. Raise your hand again, guy in the red shirt. Didn't you have her hand up? No, you didn't. The woman, in, the woman, yes, raise your hand again. Yes. There we go. Sorry. Can you say a little bit about how you would distinguish this profiling um, tool with others such as the Strength Deployment Inventory, for example, Red, Blue, Green Hub, or the Insights, Red, Blue, Yellow, Green? Um, you know, I feel like every personality framework has kind of its own strengths, its own nuances, its own vocabulary. And so I don't try to map them onto each other because I feel like then you sort of lose something because they all have sort of a different way of coming at things. But the one thing I will say it does not map onto is the houses of Hogwarts because no. <laughs> um, and if you try to make that case to me, I will say to you, Hermione, Fred, George. Obviously, they are not correlated to the tendencies because those three could not be in the same in the same house. Um, but but like Enneagram, Strength Finder, all this, all these different ones, um, I feel like they all are kind of coming at it from a slightly different angle, and I think that's useful because I think it's all a way of getting a different kind of self knowledge. Often, I find too that with with people, um, like vocabulary matters, like metaphors matter. That sometimes something's clear to you when it's posed in one way but then somebody else would find it clear if it was like sort of in a slightly different vocabulary. So I think it's great to use all these frameworks because some of them are probably gonna resonate more deeply with you than others. Yeah. Hi Gretchen, I'm Claire. Um, I'm an upholder and my wife is a rebel. Ooh, okay. <laughs> How do I get her to do the stuff I want her to do <laughs> without having to suffer the oh, consequences her head. myself? Um, well, that's tricky. Um, uh, what do you want her to do? I don't know. I feel like I have to like pull you out for that one. Like do a little, getting a little more context. I mean, the thing, the thing is, remember, rebels can do anything they choose to do. So they can, they can choose to do it for their own reasons, but... But if she chooses not to do it, I have to suffer the consequences as well. Yes, that is... That I don't is, like that. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. It's tough. I know. Um, have you got any advice One thing that you can me? do, this is one thing that you can... Oh, well, one thing you can do... If, if, one thing you can do is throw money at the problem. If you can, um, which this is the solution that does not work for everyone, but one thing is to just pay for some things to get done. Um, I, it was interesting, I was, I was giving a talk where it was an upholder who had two rebel siblings and their mother needed full-time care and the two rebels were not helping to the degree that the upholder wanted. And so it kind of as a group discussion, it, it emerged that probably what would be best was for the two rebel siblings to give money so that a help could, they, could, they could hire more help because um, that just seemed like the, the, in that situation that was possible. Um, Auto bills, anything you can automate. Um, uh, also, you know, pick things that the rubble cares about. So, like, let's say you have pets. Like, would the rubble really allow the pet to suffer? <laughs> Maybe not. So, you might back away from pet care. Uh, could be hard on the cat for a day or two. Um, or like, you know, some rebels like want things to be very tidy. You know, like some people think of rebels as being ne messy. They aren't, they often aren't messy. They want things. So it's like pick the things that the rebel cares enough that they're going to do it. Um, rather than like what you want to delegate because, I don't know, I feel like I should call on you to like give us some insight. No, you're not going to, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fall for that old trick. We set this up in advance. No. Um, no, it, it can be challenging. It can, it can be challenging um, because... 
especially if as an upholder you have you just want to get things done and you just you just feel this feeling oh, I just want to get this crossed off the list and so it's hard to wait for something to get to the point where the rebel feels the anxiety to get something done. Like I feel anxious, I, like I want to get a bill paid within a week of a bill arriving. You know, my, my, you know, but like a rebel might be like, well, why would we pay it until like we have to pay it? Well, in that, in that interim, I would feel a lot of like anxiety, like is this actually gonna happen? So, yeah. yeah, you do the bills, yeah. Yeah, part of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So try to delegate the things that you, that the are The thing is that as a rebel, you can't make yourself do it either. Yeah. So, yes. So there, there might be there are things that I'll want to do yeah. to some extent, but I yes. still can't make myself do them. Yes. Well, this is, gets into the identity thing. And it's, it's, the, it's, 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 it's infuriating as it is for other people. It's equally infuriating for us, I think. Yes. And I, yeah. don't, I don't have the answer. Yes. To this is the you can't make me and neither can no, I. I can't make yeah. me. There's a lot. I can't make me, so you can't make me. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot in the book. Many examples of how rebels work. Well, one of the things that rebels can do, for instance, is, is always tie it into freedom and choice. This is hard, maybe, with household stuff, but um, or, but like let's say it's savings. Let's say it's savings things. Um, you could say to yourself as a rebel, look, you know, people keep telling me I have to save. I don't have to save. People keep telling me I should put money in my retirement account. I don't have to put money in my retirement account. But what you could, you could flip it in your mind and be like, you know what, these marketers, they're just trying to take my money, but I am not going to fall for their fancy campaigns and their television advertisements. I'm going to save my money because I want freedom. I might want to travel. I might want to do something unexpected. I might want to move. I might want to get a horse. What do I know? I'm going to say it because then I have options. I have freedom. I can do anything I want to do if I have that nest egg because that is opportunity for me. That is my freedom. And no one is going to trick me out of my paycheck because I'm, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to use the money the way I want to. And so instead, of, I'm not going to get addicted to cigarettes. I'm not going to be chained to nicotine. I'm not going to be like, oh, big, you know, they're trying to fool me into eating their sugar, um, you know, with their fancy packages and, you know, their processed food. I'm not going to fall for that. You know, the, these kind of messages can sometimes resonate with rebels because you tell somebody what they should do or what they have to do. Well, they don't have to do it in almost every case. But so trying to tap it. I talked to a woman who was a rebel who clearly needed to lose a ton of weight, and she said, that she was unable to do it until she realized, which she loved to travel, and she realized, I'll feel more free if I feel more comfortable in an airplane. And so I want to change the way I'm eating because I have this idea of like being able to fly anywhere in the world, and that kind of freedom is what I want. And so that, it was like very like freedom, choice, getting what I want, that's gonna allow me to make the changes, rather than this is what you have to do, this is doctor's orders, um, like that. Um, there? Yeah. Listening to you, it was wonderful. I wanted to ask you, I think I am an obliger, but I struggle with one thing is uh, timekeeping. And it's first thing in the morning, basically. Um, I leave, I have enough time. I know I'm ready right out to, to get out of the door and be in work in time. But I always will find things that I think yes. it must be a must and I should finish it and nobody yes. else can do it. Yeah. Well, I know even that people can do it, yeah. but I will just pick up those bits and bobs and everything and then get myself late. Yes, okay, and so what you should, what might help with that is to set up an expectation on the other end. Um, somebody who's, something or someone that's waiting for you where you're going. Because you're feeling the weight of the expectation that's around you here. So set up an expectation on the other end. Like, I'm going to send this email. I don't know, somebody needs some information. Say to yourself, OK, I'm not going to send that email tonight. I'm going to send that as soon as I get to work in the morning at 8 o'clock or whatever it is. And so you set up an expectation that somebody's waiting for something, even in your imagination. But here's a point about exactly that kind of, uh, uh, kind of tardiness problem that's across tendencies is that when they've done studies of why people are late, very often the reason that they're late is they're trying to handle one or like a few more tasks before they leave. Um, and so just be aware that that's a very common reason. Another very common reason people are late is because they underestimate travel time. Like you're like, it takes me 20 minutes to get to work. And you're like, yeah, one day it took 20 minutes. Every other day it takes 45. You know, you're gonna be late. But it sounds like for you it's really the task. So part of it is you could also think of tasks that you're gonna do on the other end. 
um, because, uh, uh, because you want to create the weight that you're going toward so that you can ignore what's there behind you. You know, get something to pull you there. Or like don't have coffee until you get to work, you know, something like that. That might help. We've got time for probably two more questions. Okay, two more questions. Um, here. Hi. Uh, I am an obliger, but, um, what the, uh, but I became more of a rebel. Uh -huh. So you kind of feel like you fell in the point where you're not meeting your expectation or the other's expectation. So how to deal with that a bit and the that negative talk, you know, to control it a bit if there's Can a Can you way. give me an example, like where this might come up? What kind of thing? Um, let's say, yeah, I use, I, I'm a graphic designer, so I used to, you know, work very, um, I used to be very sharp on my deadlines and not even sleep the night just to fit to meet that deadline. Now I'm not, I'm really careless. I'm just yes. even notifying my client that that would be late. So, um, yes. so I don't know what happened to me. Yes, I feel that's like that's a blighter rebellion. No, yeah. and that's exactly the form that it takes. It's like when people say like I'm acting out of character, in the past, I've always been really engaged or really responsive or I was always on time. And now all of a sudden, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm careless. I, I'm late with things. I don't understand it. That's a form of obliger rebellion. So probably you're, you know, in some way, you're looking to remedy some kind of imbalance in what the expectations were. Um, so I would say like really look at like what you're being expected to do and say, is, is this, does this need to be adjusted? Because that's what Obliger Rebellion is a sign of, is that, something's, that, the, that something has gone out of balance and that you're sort of like now just like whatever, you know, or like I don't care what you people think or, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, one more. Okay, here. Hello, hi, welcome to England. Oh, thank but, you. Hi, yeah, I'm um, an obliger and I've done the happiness project a couple of times, which was like really super fun. But I don't know whether it's an obliger thing or whether you have any tips to kind of keep up the momentum. But I always find that after, I'll plan it out for a year and then after kind of month four, I kind of fall off the wagon and it's right. kind of frustrating because I'm enjoying it, but then I can't like, I just kind of fall off the wagon. Right, 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 so right, right. Okay, so if you're an obliger and you're having trouble meeting an inner expectation, the answer is always the same. The answer is always to create outer expectation. So whatever it is, and there are a million ways to keep create outer expectation. So like, what's an example of something that you stopped doing that you were enjoying doing? Um, oh, the last one I did, gosh, I have to remember. Um, Oh, I was meant to like, because I've got tons of recipe books that I buy and they live on the shelf and they never come off the shelf. <laughs> so one was to like try a new recipe um, okay. every week from one right, of my right. books. Okay, so yeah. what you could do is find a couple of friends who are also interested. That's something that very, a lot of people share that interest. Yeah. So you could say something like, okay, why don't we commit to each other that we're going to try one new recipe a week and then we're going to report back to each other on whether this is a good recipe to try or not. And so they're going to be expecting you and you can, in your mind, you can be like, well, they're looking for interesting dishes to cook themselves and if I don't give them feedback they're not going to be able to move yeah. forward in that and also say to them if, you know try to get other obligers who are like we all have to do this so that we all take it seriously because if some people blow it off then no one is going to stick to it and so you owe it to everybody in the group to be cooking every once a week and then sharing it because this is the way we will all do it you, you have to do it because otherwise you're going to encourage me not to do it and so you're going to let me down so yeah. we have to do it for each other um, and, but I wouldn't just do it with one other person, I would do it with several people so that there's like, because accountability partners can sometimes like lose interest and so you want to have enough people so that if one person kind of wanders off, there's still enough people. But so something like that where there's outer accountability, it doesn't have to be anything very formal, but you have to have a thing like Sunday night's the night when we all report back on what, you know, and this is the week we're doing stew or, or you know, if, or maybe you want to be like, you can do whatever you want. Um, but something like that, some kind of accountability. So thank you so much. Oh, Gretchen, thank this you. This was so much um, fun. Amazing. Uh, the, um, the, the thing that I love about Gretchen's work in this area, and indeed throughout her different writings and, uh, and, and musings, um, is that it's so applicable, I think. And that's the, 
often in the world of happiness, we get caught up in lofty theories and philosophy and science and other things. And actually, what we really need is really practical things we can do. And so with Action of Happiness, as many of you know, our passion is both helping individuals become happier, especially getting out of anxiety and depression and isolation and boosting our own well-being, but even, perhaps even more importantly, living in a way that contributes to everyone else's happiness. And what I love about the four tendencies is that as I think we've seen this evening, you can use this in a practical way and say, well, what am I like as a person? How can I live in, or how can I set up behaviours and ways of living that are good about bringing out the best in me? But you can also, as a partner, as a parent, as a colleague, think, how can I adjust my style to the people around me? How can I actually find out, this is a question I'm dealing with here. I can make some relatively simple changes to how I deal with them and it has a radically big impact on our relationship and our productivity and whatever it is. So I'd encourage all of us actually to try and put this into practice, not just for ourselves, but in the way that we um, interact with each other. So before we just do a final show of thanks to Gretchen, who's very kindly also agreed to stay and sign a few books, but although it does need to get away, so please don't steal all her evening. But before we, we do that one more time, just a couple of quick announcements. So our next event is back in our normal um, Conway Hall venue on the 6th of December, so that's in fact a week today, I believe, and that's with Natasha Devon, who um, is a great advocate and passionate campaigner in the area of mental health, and is going to have a kind of, uh, again, a passion-led and very entertaining, I think, and inspiring message around how we can build a culture that's more supportive of positive approaches to mental health and dealing constructively with anxiety and depression in our own lives but also in our communities. So I really encourage you to check out Natasha next week. We'll send a follow-up email with details of that and also more links back to Gretchen's great stuff. And then in the new year, we've got some fabulous things lined up as well. We've got the BBC's doctor in the house, Rangan Chatterjee, with us to talk about lifestyle, habits and, um, and well-being. We've got the fabulous Mathieu Ricard um, back here to talk about going beyond the self and his work with an eminent neuroscientist, Wolf Singer, uh, and a whole range of other fabulous things lined up next year. So do stay in touch. But most importantly, thank you all for being here, and please join me in thanking Gretchen once again for being here. Thank you.